Love just recently had a baby, and now she is very eager to marry her high school sweetheart, who's also the father of her child. This is just one complication. One, he's not quite ready. And then number two, she has a male best friend who wants to be a little bit more friendly. So uh, I'll start with some insight into the relationship with Mia and Spider, who is her high school sweetheart. Spider and I started going together when I was in the 10th grade. He was still in the 9th, but he was only a few weeks shy of his 15th birthday. His mother was hardly ever home, so we spent a whole lot of time lying in his twin-size captain's bed, staring up at stucco as if it were stars. I'd say things like, when we get married, I'll make you breakfast in bed every Saturday, or I'll make you homemade ice cream just like my Nana's. Spider was never talkative, but he always responded. Sounds good. Daydreaming back then, it seemed like we were talking about some point eons into the future, but years flew by. We started shacking, as mommy would say, in 1992. At that time, we were about seven years into our relationship. Spider was in graduate school full time, and Tebow wasn't even thought of yet when we found this apartment in the Bronx. We started off looking for something on the concourse near the courthouse. Cheaper rent brought us six blocks over. From the get-go, Spider wasn't too keen on the neighborhood. I had to come see it for myself. I lit up when the gypsy cab turned onto 167th Street. Everything was on 167th Street. A 99 cent store, subway station, supermarket, bodega hardware store, laundromat, even a check cashing place. When a cab turned on to Sherman Avenue and stopped, I spotted the new building with the surveillance camera out front. Immediately, I bounced up and down. That's it, Spider, that's it. I dropped a $10 bill through the chute and jumped out. Standing out front with my issue of Bronx apartment listings, I flipped the pages searching for the circled ad with the passcode to open the gate. I found the page, but there was no code number. I looked up, a security guard was on her way down the steps. Spider had pressed the zero button. Who are you here to see, she asked. I smiled, showing her the ad. Wrong building. She pointed across the street. Our building wasn't only off by one digit. Spider and I looked across the street. Cardboard was duct taped to every window on the first floor. I sucked my teeth, but we walked right in through the open gate. Spider tried to pull it closed, but the gate creaked back until its corner lodged into the sidewalk. He looked at me. <laughs> what was I supposed to say? Plus, I didn't want to open my mouth. Something somewhere was rank. I held my breath as we headed up the stairs, swatting away horseflies, three big ones. Spider stopped at the landing and turned to me, raising his eyebrows. Are you sure about this? I shrugged. This is the best I can do for now until you find work. Whatever. We reached over to the top button and rang for the superintendent. Nothing buzzed, beeped, or made any other kind of noise. And with this place looking the way it did, it was safe to assume the intercom was broken. Spider shook his head, so I rolled my eyes and stepped across him. Black paint and rust peeled off the door. Someone had popped the lock. A knotted rope looped through the hole where the knob should have been. I looked at it thinking, why didn't they just replace the knob? But I pulled the rope and opened the door. After ringing almost every bell on the first floor, we found Raphael, the superintendent. He was about Spider's complexion, had a dark afro, but his sideburns and mustache and beard were all silver. I looked down as he stepped out of his apartment, dragging his right side, bracing himself with an orthopedic adjustable cane. Stunned, my gaze went from the rubber tip of that cane to his ashy hand that gripped the handle, up plaster, the green tattoo on his forearm that read Santo Domingo, to his wrinkled pink street shirt and the cigarette shaking as it dangled from his lips. With a jittery right hand, he removed it, Blowing a, a stream of smoke as thick as its accent, he said, stroke. Now I know exactly why this building looked the way it did. And I'll stop there.
the Ramel character, uh, they grew up together, they were raised together, and they went to all the same schools up until college. And now he is a successful investment banker, and she's still tr struggling to make ends meet. So of course it's an interesting di dynamic, especially since this is her, her best friend. So she's sharing every aspect of her life, phone conversations and, and the like. So we're gonna start off here with a phone call. Can we switch mothers? <laughs> Dawn told her about the keys, huh? Ramel laughed. I know he thought I was stupid for telling her. Dawn's mouth was bigger than her behind. But with all my girlfriends out of state and me with no long distance carrier, who else would I call about girl stuff? Mommy, I suck my teeth. Are you a psychic friend? <laughs> nah, my advice is free. Next time, save yourself the trouble. Tell your mom from the get-go like I suggested. Whose side are you on? Chocolate. When it comes to you and your family, I blow the whistle and wear the stripes. Now hold on, I have someone else on the other line. The phone line clicked twice, but the call switched back to me. Ramel's voice had turned to syrup. Yeah, a Cosmo, like I was saying. I feel real bad, I really do, because you and I have a lot of fun together. But I've gotta be honest, we don't have much in common, so I guess. I cut Ramel off, doing my best to imitate his voice, but sounding more like Cookie Monster. It's best that we just be friends. I got a chuckle out of him, so I kept it up. The last thing I wanna do is waste your time. I'd still like us to hang out once in a while if that's okay with you. I close by saying, and the Oscar goes to. Ramel's voice was just above a whisper, but it had bass. That combination could lull me right to sleep or wake me up from it. Even though I didn't sound a bit like him, I knew I had the script down cold because he was still laughing when he said, <laughs> trust me, Chocolate, if I ever give you something stiff, bare naked, and about that size, it won't be an Oscar. Now knock it off, she won't buy it unless I'm composed. Now, the interesting thing about the Ramel character is that he doesn't typically date African-American women, which frustrates his best friend. So to share her frustration, she writes him a poem, strangely enough entitled Chocolate Love. Her poem goes, you worked so hard, now I know why. It's because you like the finer things in life. It seems you have all life's luxuries. How is it you're missing what you need? Chocolate love every day can melt your fears away and have you feeling new. That's what chocolate can do. So many women, you like them fine, in different flavors, like you like your wine. Consider yourself a connoisseur. Sometimes less is more. Chocolate love every day can melt your fears away and have you feeling Ooh, that's what chocolate can do. Moet is okay, so is Dom Perignon, caviar, and filet mignon. But really, your lifestyle doesn't mean a thing if you still feel incomplete. On up to hail a taxi, wondering if I had enough for, for the fare. Reaching into my purse for my wallet, I noticed I didn't feel my keys. I ran my hands across the bottom, nothing. I realized where they were. Taking a deep breath, I looked to my left. Less than half a block away, a peanut vendor was roasting nuts from the cart, releasing a honey-sweet aroma, but the thought of eating the peanuts was not as appealing as the thought of hurling them at Ramel and sending his ass into anaphylactic shock. I looked back at the doorway of Pookie's just as Ramel came, stepping out, hands in the pockets of his black slacks, two plastic bags hanging loosely at his left. Because he works out a lot, his posture is erect, but his swagger seemed looser than ever. Still, I saw a tension in his face. No dimples now, he had locked jaw. He looked at me cock-eyed. No cab, or did you just realize where you left your keys? I didn't answer that, and I didn't say a word to him in the cab. I tossed my head, flinging my hair back over my shoulder, twisting my body away from him and crossed my legs. Ramel tried to get my attention by whistling Marvin Gaye's I Want You. When that didn't work, he started pelting my feet with pellets of used chewing gum wrapped in foil, seven pieces in about 10 minutes. I figured he was chewing all that gum and spitting out just to annoy me. 
but I kept my back to him the entire ride, walked ahead of him into the building. We rode up to the 37th floor in separate elevators. As soon as he unlocked his door, I bolted into the living room. Even in my slim skirt and crocodile pumps, I was Flojo. My leg banged into his marble cocktail table, sending it spinning on its axis until the halves formed a, formed a circle. I dented my shin, but I wasn't rubbing my boo-boo. I jumped right on his slinky sofa, leaning over it, reaching until I snatched my keys off the rug. Then I made a beeline for the door, hoping I could run right out, but he blocked my exit. When I stepped to the left, he stepped to that side. When I tried to veer right, he kept right in front of me. I knew he would not let me pass. I had no choice but to get in his face. What? You don't want to be with me? I shook my head. You don't want to be with me? No, I don't. You show up in stilettos and a little skirt and you expect me to believe that you don't want me? I did this for Spider. <laughs> well, Spider isn't here now, is he? And what about your poem? What about it? I wanted you to know how I feel. Oh, so you admit you have feelings for me. Please, Rommel, that poem is about your situation. My situation, huh? Yeah, that's the perfect solution. It, well, if you think you and I hooking up will be the perfect solution, why don't you just say you want me? Are you mental? How long have you wanted me, Mia? How long? Now, I know you've lost it. What makes you think I want you? Your poem, I got it right here. He patted himself down, pulled the page out of his back pocket, unfolded in front of me. There, there, you say all through this how you're gonna melt my fears away and how you're gonna make me feel. I looked, reading aloud, half-heartedly. Chocolate love every day can melt your fears away and have you feeling new. That's what chocolate can do. Then I shook my head, and? He smacked his bald head, paced, and then banged the back of it into the wall. Chocolate, your last name is love. So I wrote this to motivate you to embrace black love. Stop it. The only black love you want me to embrace is you. Now I read the whole thing through and I could see how he could make that assumption. The words chocolate and love were both capitalized all through the poem. But I didn't do that intentionally. That connection didn't even occur to me when I jotted the lines down. My mind was in a totally different place. I laughed, but he didn't see the humor in this. His face was as stiff as steel. I tried to explain. I know how this looks, Ramel, but that was the meaning behind this poem. I meant chocolate as opposed to vanilla or any other flavor. Chocolate is just a metaphor for black and love is just love, the emotion, not my last name. That's just a coincidence. This ain't no coinky dink. I told you before, you won't be happy until I'm with someone who's your height, your weight, and your complexion. What I should have said is you won't be happy until I'm with you. Why don't you just admit it? Hello, I'm in a relationship with Spider. Remember him? Real tall, kind of goofy. I love him. Seriously, I wasn't coming on to you. He stood, huffing and puffing for a moment. And then he looked at me hard. Did you eat any peanuts? No, what the hell kind of question is? I didn't get a chance to finish my sentence. The next thing I knew, I felt his warm tongue stroking mine and tickling the roof of my mouth. And I stopped there.